Hi, everyone. My name is Pai. I'm the partner of Venture Capital and Head of Strategic Planning at SCB 10 x And today I'm excited to be here with Paul, um, partner of Pantera Capital. Hi, Paul. It's good to see you again. Hey, Pai. Good to see you, too. Yeah, I think before we dive into detail about the current state of crypto, um, could you briefly introduce yourself and Pantera Capital? How did you get started in this journey? And what's the focus of Pantera Capital? Sure. So, um, you know, my name is Paul Veratitakit. I'm a partner at Pantera Capital. Uh, first and foremost, I'm uh, similar to you. I'm also, a, a, you know, from Thailand. So I think that's always good to sort of note out there. But uh, starting off with Pantera Capital, Pantera Capital is one of the largest institutional funds focused on cryptocurrencies and blockchain. You know, it started by Dan Moorhead, who was the CFO and head of global macro trading and Tiger Management, one of the largest hedge funds in the world in the 80s and 90s. And Pantera started off as a global macro hedge fund, pivoted to focusing on cryptocurrency slash Bitcoin in 2003, launching the first institutional fund to invest into Bitcoin. Uh, that fund has done very well. I think it's was investing into Bitcoin when Bitcoin was $40. So performance of the fund has been around 60,000 and 70,000 uh, percent. We also have a venture capital strategy that invests into equity in companies. We also invest into early stage tokens, so pre-sales or investing before projects launch their token. And then the last strategy is also <clears throat> revolving on tokens, investing into tokens after they have been listed on the exchange, so a liquid token strategy. So overall, we manage about uh, $4.5 billion. Uh, we are based primarily in the U.S., about 70 people located across Puerto Rico, New York, San Francisco, and, and even Los Angeles. Um, you know, for us, I mean, we're really excited about uh, investing. We've been doing it for the last eight years, and we look to sort of be the, the black rock for crypto, just focusing on investment management products for our investors. Uh, lastly, myself, I've been investing with Pantera since early 2014. Uh, so for the last eight years, I've been just looking at cryptocurrencies and blockchain. You know, I started off my career as an economic consultant. I moved over and did venture capital in the mobile space before joining Pantera. And, you know, how I got into this space, really a few early investors, uh, you know, investors like Lightspeed really started telling me about crypto in 2013. I went down the rabbit hole and... For me, the reason why I wanted to get into this space was really I felt like financial services, um, you know, really needed to be disrupted. And I felt like uh, decentralization was the way for that to happen, uh, starting off with, you know, Bitcoin being a better store of value, but uh, eventually moving over to things like remittances and payments, especially in, uh, especially in emerging markets, really got me excited, uh, especially coming from Southeast Asia and Thailand. So uh, hoping that cryptocurrencies can really make that disruption. I wanted to get into the space. Uh, I felt like Pantera had the institutional DNA to really make this happen. And I really wanted to bring my venture experience to the uh, cryptocurrency space you know while it was a bit early felt like it was a great time to really learn a lot build out the thesis and build out the infrastructure and relationships to support a, a much larger ecosystem wow uh, what an uh, interesting journey and, and long journey you have and i think congratulations on the such an outperforming performance of the fund um so let's get started um there are a lot of events happened this year paul i think at a macro level uh, we are facing with economic turmoil uh, at the industry level. Um, there was a collapse of Terra Luna um, ecosystem following with the bankruptcies of um, Celsius and Three Arrow Capital. Um, how do you see these events having an impact to the crypto industry uh, in the short term and long term? Yeah, you know, I think uh, I, I think we knew we were going into a bit of a recession. But to layer on top of the recession, you know, these events, uh, you know, I think it's, it's good for the industry. You know, while some of these events have happened at a fairly large scale, Terra Luna and uh, Celsius and 3AC, it, you know, it, it, it could have happened maybe even at a larger scale in the future. So, you know, I take these 
events as sort of growing pains for the industry, similar to, I guess, Mount Gox that happened in 2014. You know, that was sort of a rude awakening on exchanges really needing to, you know, provide a bit more transparency, you know, uh, leaders uh, going out there and making sure that they're doing the right things in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the best practices around, around, you know, sort of, you know, custody and, and whatnot. And so I, I think for, uh, you know, starting off with, you know, things like Terra Luna, I mean, it really just highlights the fact that uh, there is a lot of risk out there and, uh, you know, you have to really sort of, um, you know, highlight those risks and make sure that investors know what's going on, especially around, uh, algorithmic stable coins and you know even with that risk people still went in there and um you know DeFi held up you know Terra Luna did what it was supposed to do it just you know it was just a mechanism that just just didn't work and I think it just brings a bit more caution and rigorous diligence that needs to go into each of these protocols uh before sort of quote unquote aping in but nevertheless I mean I know that there were people that went into that protocol really feeling like it was doing what it's supposed to do um, and, and it would hold up. Uh, I think the latter is more important. And it really just shows that, you know, people do have to do their diligence, but also have diversification. I think diversification is extremely important in this industry when it's early uh, and there is enough risk uh, around in these, uh, in these types of protocols. Um, we all knew that Terra Luna, at least for, for the most part, was not risk-free. And there's things that are, there's just devil, different levels of risk out there in, in DeFi. And you have to be able to sort of size your position based off of that. Uh, same thing with things like 3AC and Celsius. It uh, really highlights the fact that uh, DeFi is uh, exciting because there's just a bit more transparency out there. And while you can sort of see how you're getting your yields from DeFi, you can also evaluate some of the risk that's out there with some of these DeFi protocols versus Celsius and 3AC, where you're giving your money to a centralized entity and you're hoping that they are doing the right things around getting yield and security and all of that. And, you know, it just shows that, you know, with DeFi, you're, you know, you're custodying your own assets, uh, you know, so you're really taking out the security risk. And then also in terms of the discretionary investment risk or just having transparency on where your funds are, I think are extremely important, how much counterparty risk and how much leverage, et cetera. And so, you know, I think, I think, I think right now we're gonna, gonna see a lot more transparency with centralized, um, you know, financial systems and ones that are tapping into DeFi. And if there's not enough transparency, then I think folks will sort of forego some of that risk or size it more correctly. So I think it's just going to be, uh, you know, a really healthy growth for us to kind of go through these scenarios. And, you know, same thing that happened in 2017, 2018 with ICOs and investing into early stage token projects. I believe that there's going to be uh, a lot more education on what to look for before putting out capital into some of these protocols or centralized systems to generate any sort of yield. And as these protocols and these standards uh, sort of get developed, um, you know, we're just gonna see you know, a, a healthier ecosystem where people feel a lot more comfortable. Mm, got you. And regarding the recent failure of centralized platform, I think you touched on a bit in terms of what could be improved like the transparencies and any thoughts on the regulator side, regulation? Yeah, I really do feel that uh, there's going to be a lot more regulatory scrutiny that is going to come onto our space. And uh, these events are really accelerating that uh, scrutiny and process where, uh, in a way, it's probably a good thing where the regulators are coming in and uh, figuring out what's going on and learning as fast as possible. 
you know, whatever happens with these cases, I'm sure it'll take a long time in the courts and whatnot. But, you know, we really do hope that there will be just a bit more clarity in terms of regulation so that companies and entrepreneurs can move forward and figure out what they need to do to give, you know, sort of comfort and confidence to retail users. Because at the end of the day, I mean, you know, while you may have a good brand out there, uh, if there's still a lot of uncertainty with regulations, it's going to prevent larger pools of capital from coming mm. into this space, especially institutional capital. We know that they want to get in. And right now they're having to form, you know, different types of entities. They have to do so with, you know, partners own personal capital. I mean, there's just not enough comfort to kind of come in. And, you know, for this space to really grow, we do need a bit more regulatory clarity so that, you know, both investors that want to come into these companies can come in and you know put capital but also the entrepreneurs can figure out like what their their strategy is on the regulatory side it's hard to really sort of keep moving around and trying to cover your bases and so you know i think it'll it'll really start in the u.s you know i think a lot of countries really follow the u.s in terms of regulations and uh, the good thing is uh, it looks like the U.S. is waiting a little bit and, and learning instead of going out there like China or maybe India and, and trying to ban cryptocurrencies, uh, fiat on-ramps, which are extremely important for retail to come into this space. Mm -hmm. um, there are senators out there like Senator Loomis trying to come up with bills that will sort of shift regulations from the SEC to more of the CFTC, which we feel like is going to be a bit more sort of beneficial for innovation. And so, you know, I think for us, we're trying to do all of our parts in terms of educating our entrepreneurs to do what they should be on the regulatory side, trying to educate policy so that uh, they can do what's best in terms of uh, the innovation in the space. So uh, I think it's extremely important. We really do want good regulation to come fairly soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with you, especially if we want to bring in more capital from the institution. Yep. Um, so, Paul, we are here in 10 year plus in this crypto experiment and we are entering the third crypto winter. What can we expect out of this bear market and how do you feel about this winter? Is it similar or different than the previous one? I think it's, I think it's, uh, there are some similarities and there are some some differences. You know, I'll talk a little bit about the differences first, and then I'll talk about the similarities. I think really the differences um, really revolve around, you know, the makeup of this bear market and what is causing it. But the similarities are what we can all do during this bear market to really sort of succeed. Uh, in terms of this bear market and, and how it's different, you know, the last bull market was really driven by ICOs and retail. And once, you know, once the correction happened and a lot of the ICOs got washed out, regula regulations started to come in a bit, then, um, you know, uh, prices dropped 85, 90% and we entered a, a bear market. Uh, what we learned from the last bear market or what, what happened during the last bear market was really seeing that there are problems around both uh, the ICO model, which I believe was fixed because now there's um, you know new legal structures around doing token projects. Mm -hmm. There's a vesting schedule and it's really suited now more towards longer term institutional investors guys that are really going to sort of grow with these companies in terms of just flippers and really highlighted problems around scalability, uh, the need for scalability, more platforms, interoperability, et cetera. And we started to see some pretty good entrepreneurs coming in during the last bear market. Uh, the last bull market that just happened is much different than 2017 and 2018. Uh, it was really driven by DeFi. So it was really driven by an actual sort of, you know, strong sector that really pushed the ecosystem forward and use cases that really started to make sense. Um, mm. You know, we really started to 
also see a lot of strong entrepreneurs coming into this space, but uh, we started to see the emergence of uh, slightly newer use cases too that I believe haven't even scratched the surface yet like DeFi. So things around gaming and NFTs. And I think that's gonna be even bigger during the next bull market. But I also think what's different is we saw a lot of uh, institutional capital come in during the last bull market, which didn't happen in 2017, 2018. So for instance, you know, our last fund that we raised 1.3 billion has endowments and pension funds and a bit of everything, right? And then of course we also saw Michael, Michael Saylor and um, you know, Elon, all these uh, folks looking at Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as corporate treasury, which hadn't happened beforehand too. So all of these developments really lead to, uh, while you know this time around we didn't expect the war and the recession, really leads to more permanent capital and a lot more funds that are raised where during this bear market, I think more than the last one, we are seeing more top tier entrepreneurs, more serial entrepreneurs coming into this space and building. And there's just a lot more use cases for them to build. It's kind of moved from scalability to more of the, cross-chain developer infrastructure and application layer, uh, especially revolving around some of the infrastructure and applications on the consumer side of things. Um, so uh, that in addition to now a lot more permanent capital to be able to fund those companies. So what I see is that we're probably not going to have as much of a bear market from the entrepreneurial and ecosystem funding side of things um, while it looks pretty bare on the public side of things because of the uh, recession added on top of it, mm -hmm. I really do feel like when, when we do rebound from the macro side of things, uh, the, uh, the innovation and the company and the use cases will help us rebound from the spare market even quicker and even in a greater magnitude than the last time. So it's, it's a really exciting time to be in this space. Mm, yeah, interesting to see what's coming out of, of this demo I get. So uh, you touched uh, on a few trends that um, um, actually was in your prediction in of last year, like infrastructure and also one of them uh, is also including Web3. And maybe start with the, the infrastructure side. Um, you mentioned like um, the challenging chains, like non-e-chains, layer two um, solutions, interoperability solutions in your prediction in the plus year. And just curious, like what is the um, current state of um, these areas? Um, and what do you see as a, a future of network, version of future network, especially after, you know, the the um, E just announced the, the merge date to be in September. Yeah, I mean, I do think we're gonna be probably a little bit less focused on you know talking about the need for scalability even though that's going to be sort of an ongoing you know task and, and mission for the ecosystem i think with the eth merge it's it's really exciting and you can see so in terms of just you know people the price of eth and people just being excited about um, you know, what's going on. I'm sure all of the layer twos are really excited that are building on top of Ethereum too. And it kind of leads right into, into DevCon, but we're also seeing a lot of innovation with, you know, Solana and I'm sure they're going to sort of continue to improve. And, um, you know, we're starting to see a little bit of consolidation too, you know, where I would say Ethereum Solana has been making pretty large moves late last year and then early this year in terms of developers building on top near Avalanche. I mean, there's, there's, there's starting to be a bit more consolidation on the layer one side. And then of course, you know, new protocols that are focusing on helping to sort of move assets across chain. Um, you know, I, I think every application is going to be eventually cross chain. And so we're gonna need technology that sort of helps with that. And then beyond that, I mean, in terms of infrastructure, I'm actually really excited about investing outside the United States. That's like one of our theses. And, you know, that's why, you know, we've kind of built up the great relationship with 
um, you know, SED because, you know, we really do feel like the same sort of infrastructure that exists in the United States. And if you look at like all of the, the unicorn map for blockchain, you know, right now 60 to 70% of the unicorns are in the U.S., but it's really just because, you know, that's where a lot of the, the, um, the entrepreneurs have started. But I think we're starting to see some of that same infrastructure emerge in Latin America, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, and even more in, in East Asia, especially around institutional investors. So especially as more and more regulations come out, we think that it's going to push more entrepreneurs to create infrastructure for institutions, custody, trading, ETFs, indexes, derivatives, all this kind of stuff. And so we're going to see a, a lot of the similar companies in the U.S. just get formed outside of the uh, U.S. And I think there's an opportunity to get in at really good valuations. Um, outside of that, I mean, the other infrastructure that we're looking at right now is, you know, we really do feel like NFTs and gaming is really going to help push the next wave forward in terms of the bull market. And so for us, we're trying to figure out, you know, what are, you know, some of the good, you know, developer tools or infrastructure that's needed for, you know, both of those use cases to really go forward. I mean, for instance, we just made a recent investment in a company called Optic. We co-led it with Kleiner Perkins. Kind of think about mm -hmm. them like a chain analysis for NFTs. I mean, you know, if this space is going to get big, there's going to be a lot of scams and frauds out there. So if mm -hmm. you have a tool for consumers or businesses that can help them figure out which NFT is real or which NFT is a fake and be able to, you know, then, you know, kind of help protect both sides. I think that's you know, extremely important for this space to grow. Or maybe on the gaming side, it's something where, you know, it just makes uh, developers a little bit easier to sort of build a, a wallet that's that's more suited towards, you know, a crypto game, or maybe it's something, you know, some tool to sort of like figure out, um, you know, tokenomics or whatnot. I mean, I think there's a lot of things right now that we've seen in both areas that are sort of needed to be solved for the next wave to happen. So, you know, I think, I think those are the areas that we're most excited about is continuing to sort of see, you know, what we can, what we can invest in to make it just a lot easier for these developers on NFTs and on gaming to sort of scale their products. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I don't think I've seen a lot of tools in, in this space. Uh, any other emerging trend in DeFi or Web3 that you want to share more? Yeah, on, on DeFi right now, I mean, you know, I think for us, like we are looking um, at, uh, you know, probably areas that we have invested into a little bit in the past, but I think that are going to sort of evolve a bit more. So still looking at things like derivatives, um, we feel like there's an opportunity there where, you know, in the traditional markets, I mean, there's more volume on derivatives than spot market, yet in crypto right now, uh, it doesn't look that way. And, you know, maybe, you know, moving to new architectures and new chains like DYDX, maybe the Cosmos. I mean, there might be there might be an acceleration of uh, you know that use case because there's just a lot more sort of transaction throughput, and so you know there might be uh, more complex financial products uh, on the DeFi side that emerge outside of Ethereum right now that gain a bit of traction. So we are looking for derivatives on other chains, just to be able to see if, you know, that really helps kind of, you know, solve some of the problems to kind of get that particular use case to larger scale. So I think, um, you know, whether it's that or whether it's like better, you know, different types of infrastructure around liquid staking, I think is, you know, another, you know, I think uh, staking derivatives can really just bring a lot more liquidity to the space and, you know, we're investors in Lido, but I think there's just more and more innovation that can happen around staking derivatives. Um, you know, outside of that, I mean, if there's any other, I, I think we really do want to focus a little bit more on developer tools 
And, you know, for us, just, you know, one, some of the areas that we, we think are important as we sort of go into this next bull market is around security. So we are looking fairly deeply at different types of, you know, whether it's formal verification or whether it's, you know, security tied in with maybe things like insurance. You know, we really do feel like, you know, this space gets a lot more institutional. Both retail and institutions need to have better uh, products that can help protect them. And so whether it is, you know, on the retail side, maybe something that sort of analyzes your transactions and making sure that it doesn't kind of uh, fall into any sort of, you know, rug pulls or things like that, or maybe on the institutional side, being able to protect your funds, um, you know, within certain protocols by having insurance backing it, or maybe even for entrepreneurs themselves to have, you know, individual insurance for their companies, mm -hmm. which hasn't existed before in the past in a cost affordable way. So I think that's going to be sort of part of the growth of the ecosystem is around those two areas. Mm, that's interesting. Uh, I think Paul, we are almost out of time. Like um, final question, how long do you think this winter will last and any recommendations to the founders to survive the winter? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a great point. So on how long this bear market will last, I really do feel like this bear market is, is driven a bit more this time from macro conditions. So I do feel when maybe the, the, the CPI kind of gets to a certain point, when the Fed start, stop sort of raising rates, uh, I think that'll really help kind of start getting us out of this. And then I think the rebound will happen quicker in crypto versus the traditional market. So I think that's something to sort of watch out really quickly is it can really turn right away. I think, you know, things like the Ethereum merge and other sort of outside factors around regulations could really help kind of push us out of the rebound. And in terms of the entrepreneurs, you know, what I've told people, especially in my blog, uh, Verita Verdict, I wrote down a few different things that they can think about. You know, they should really think about their runway and making sure that they have at least 12 months of runway, uh, mm -hmm. if not closer to 24 months. So that means either figuring out business model and getting to profitability quicker or extending your runway either from reducing your burn or you know, raising a bit more capital if you can. But this is the best time to be building. This is the best time to be hiring if you need it because there's a mm -hmm. lot of companies that are doing layoffs. And mm -hmm. this is also a good time to actually be building up your brand. A lot of people are struggling during this time. And if you can kind of go out there and organically build out your brand, do things like, like um, events and, and podcasts and things like that, uh, it'll go a long way to being able to, you know, sort of have you rebound stronger from a marketing perspective. So I really do feel like this is the time to really figure out how to get to product market fit while also, you know, building out the internal infrastructure to set yourself for success, making sure that your system works if you already found product market fit and can sort of scale um, for the next bull market. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Paul. I think we are running out of time and I encourage everyone to follow Paul's um, blog. He's an amazing writer. Thank you, Paul. All right. Thank you so much.